Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome here tonight our panel of distinguished guests and leading lights in the oil and gas industry. Now, seated in no particular order, first of all, I'd like to welcome onto the stage Gordon Ballard. Now, Gordon is Chairman and Vice President of Industry Affairs at Schlumberger. He's climbed an impressive ladder in the company, having started with them in 1981 as a wireline field engineer. Welcome, Gordon Ballard. <laughs> Sitting next to Gordon is Trevor Garlick. Trevor is the regional president for BP's North Sea business with responsibility for their assets in the UK and Norway, a position he's held since 2010. Welcome. Next, we have Glenn Cayley. Glenn is upstream director of Shell UK and Ireland. A keen supporter of geology, Glenn has played active and leading roles in the Geological Society. He's a member of SPE and the American Association of Petroleum Ge uh, Geologists. Welcome. <laughs> uh, sitting next to... Uh, to you, Glenn, we have Pete Jones, Managing Director for TACA's UK oil and gas business. Pete took over the reins last May and is responsible for the company's operations in the North Sea. <clears throat> And finally, please welcome Jeremy Cresswell. Jeremy is editor of Energy, the Press and Journal's monthly supplement covering the energy sector, notably upstream oil and gas and renewables. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, all of you gentlemen are highly regarded leaders in the North Sea's oil and gas industry, as I said, and the reason you've all accepted SPE Aberdeen's invitation tonight is solely related to your passion and your belief that you have in the industry. Um, I'd like to kick off this panel discussion. My first question is to you, Glenn. Um, tonight we have in the panel what many would consider competitors, um, but how important is it in the industry to strike up uh, the right balance between competitors and collaboration? Good question, um, and a really important question given where the basin is at the moment. <clears throat> so as an industry, um, we're probably amongst the most effective at balancing both. Apart from some of the early days with BP, very, very few operators um, were not in a partnership of some sort. And of course, with, with Shell, it was um, the Shell SO joint venture, which uh, started in 1964. Um, so I think we've had a long history of, of both competing and closely collaborating, uh, particularly on projects. And of course, um, as wells were drilled, as discoveries were appraised, we collaborated um, on fields. I think the challenge that the industry faces now is around finding ways of collaborating across the whole basin. Um, you know, we, we do compete, but frankly, um, the collaboration elements and grasping economies in particular, uh, and not repeating the mistakes of others, but sharing you know, best practice or, or, or better practice, is now so important that I think there's wide recognition that um, you know, the competition element is taking a bit of a backseat in favor of much deeper collaboration, both uh, between operators and, and vitally across the supply chain. And Trevor, what would you say? What's your opinion on this? I feel like I'm in the, the middle of the two heavyweights here. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I'm not thinking at anyone. <laughs> uh, no comment. Um, I think. <laughs> uh, well, Glenn and I uh, work together, actually, on many things, and Glenn often quips that uh, uh, his bonus is in my hands, because in, 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 in the case in this area, a lot, of, uh, a lot of Shell's operations are with BP, but uh, we're running them. Uh, it's, I think if you're from outside the sector, uh, you would be surprised at the level of collaboration that exists if you're outside of this sector. Uh, so strangers who come in 
particularly when we see, for example, you know, government uh, ministers change as they do, uh, come in and look at our industry and they, they, I think they're quite surprised, genuinely surprised by the amount of collaboration that goes on. But I think that we are inside the sector and we're quite critical, as Glenn says, and we, of, of ourselves and, and we can see the potential of a lot more collaboration and it's become, you know, the trendy word uh, and of course the Wood Report has underlined that and emphasised that and I think what we're trying to grapple with now is what do you actually do rather than talk about when you mean collaborate more and I think there, as Glenn says, there is a, there's a huge opportunity whether it's between uh, oil companies operators or whether it's between the suppliers and, uh, themselves amongst themselves or suppliers and operators that we've, we've actually got to um, crystallise a little bit about what we actually do uh, to, to make things um, a little easier on ourselves because you know, I'm sure you'll come to it but the, you know, the, the industry is facing some significant challenges. But as a journalist I have to ask is it ever possible to collaborate when you really are competitors and you are obviously striving for, for profit? Well, I mean, there are some easy examples, for instance, logistics. You know, we had, um, we had quite a time of it as airframes were grounded um, following the tragedy off Shetland. And, you know, we had to somehow work very, very collaboratively to get our workforce offshore efficiently with 30% fewer aircraft. Um, that, that's a simple example of, you know, how and, and why we need to push harder at, what are frankly pretty easy wins. Um, I think, you know, the areas of, of really intense competition are really at the start of the funnel. So, you know, we all compete to a high degree around exploration technology and exploration um, knowledge, um, how, you know, the value is, is created in the first place. But when it comes to the bulk of activity in the North Sea, which is operations, maintenance, improving production efficiency, Frankly, we've got far more to gain, and, 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 and we are gaining a lot more by really collaborating. Right. Excellent. Um, I'd like to, meet, uh, to move on now to you, Pete. Um, how rich is the North Sea in terms of its reserves, primarily those that pertain to the UK continental shelf? Um, there's a, I'd say there's a huge amount still to play for in the North Sea. Um, there is significant reserves there. And we've seen the industry overcome many, many different challenges and technology come through as we've developed different uh, drilling techniques and development techniques and, and uh, field development plans. So uh, there's, there's a huge amount to play for out there. I guess the challenge is, is the questions about continuing to be economic and continuing to be competitive in the global environment. Um, Collaboration is a key part of, of, uh, of helping that but we really need to maintain our focus on the basics of production efficiency, uh, particularly just now cost control, and working with the supply chain, probably breaking some new uh, barriers and making sure we, we work even closer and in a different way with that, um, just on the base production before we can really also access future projects. And that, again, is, is with the supply chain a critical, critical element, I think, for where we are just now is we need some, um, some fiscal change to help support that. We're at a very difficult point, I think, in the industry. Trevor mentioned that there. Collaboration will get us so far, and, and addressing the challenges and the prickly conversations we probably need to have, but there, there probably needs to be something else, really, to, to help that momentum keep going. So lots, lots and lots to play for, but let's make sure we keep our eye on the ball and, uh, and get some support through the fiscal regime. What would your position at BP be, Trevor? Um, I think we've got to, um, you know, we, as I say, I think we already work quite well at, on partnerships, but I think in terms of the future reserves, um, I think there's a very wide range of ultimate recovery. And on the one end, if you take the, you know, the graph of the, all the people in this room are very familiar with of, of declining production over the last few years, uh, and you integrate under that curve, you, you, you get a number of, you know, 10, 11 billion barrels. But of course, every one of us is investing and really hard and working really hard at trying to stem decline, even though it's a natural resource and it will decline. And we're also investing heavily to bring on new fields and investing not that heavily, but we are investing in 
exploration seismic and exploration drilling. So we're all, um, I guess, uh, hopeful and optimistic that the basin has more to give. I think it has more to give both in terms of exploration finds, discovery, if you like, but we have to drill wells and we have to shoot more seismic to, to be able to drill those wells. Uh, but I think there's a huge recovery prize as well, and it's something that uh, uh, a lot of us have been working on, actually, in the last, uh, the last couple of years, which is this vision that actually you don't, you, you don't kind of, it's so hard to find it in the first place. You don't walk away at 35% or even 40% recovery. You actually push yourself to try and find ways, first technically, and then commercially, to, you know, to push your recovery factors to 50, 60%. And uh, that, is, that is done in other parts of the world. It's done in perhaps easier climbs or land-based you know, land reservoirs. But uh, I think that the technologies exist, and there are, there's also the government willpower, even in, even in the Treasury, to help us um, do more schemes and push the reserves. So I'm personally optimistic if we, you know, this collaboration's a component, but I actually think just thinking about uh, pushing recovery as much as pushing discovery. You know, hear all the time about we should drill more exploration wells. Of course we should. Um, but actually, I think we've got to push the recovery side of the equation as well. Uh, Gordon, on the end here, I'd like to address this question to you now. The North Sea has been active, as we know, for 40 years. And whilst the messages related to the oil reserves are often somewhat contradictory, why is decommissioning playing such an important part these days? So I think uh, decommissioning actually is a bit of a dichotomy because on one hand, it's an opportunity for the contractors. And if I were already seeing 400 million up to a billion coming in the next couple of years, especially around well decommissioning. So there's an opportunity there, um, but it's going to have to be done efficiently, etc. But on the other side, uh, we actually want to delay decommissioning if we want to maximize the recovery of the UK continental shelf. So. Uh, it's important for those two reasons, but you know, we shouldn't be rushing headlong down. You know, let's hurry up, let's get decommissioned. We don't want to decommission. Clearly, we have to decommission, and we also have to be decommissioned after a certain amount of time, but we need the infrastructure to stay in place. And I think, in the end, that's a bigger prize for the whole industry. So it's a long term. You basically are here for the long term. Absolutely. No, no, and uh, uh, we can be here for the long term. But uh, those have also seen the, the way the costs are rising. And it's a very UK-specific issue with the declining production and uh, um, some would say the kind of high cost of the, this basin. Uh, and when that needs to be sorted out. Otherwise, it could get quite short. Um, we talked about collaboration. We've collaborated on safety before, but, uh, and we continue to do so. But we have to collaborate on efficiency. We need to get better, or it will be uh, bad news for everyone. Um, do you think that the wider public actually understands the impact that decommissioning will have on the local industry here in the northeast? No, I think this is an industry that, for most people, begins and ends in the forecourt, or, on the, or, the, or your, your utility bill, your gas bill. Um, this is one of the very, very few communities in the UK that appears to have an understanding, and for obvious reasons, because of the incredibly important uh, contribution that this industry makes uh, to, to, our, to our local economy. Otherwise, the rest of the UK, there'll be, there are, there'll be pockets of understanding, like around, uh, around Tyneside, Teesside, uh, down in the, sort of around Great Yarmouth, and so on and so forth, and perhaps even Morecambe Bay. But beyond that, no, it's, it, it, it's very limited, and understandably so. I mean. Quite literally, most folk are, are only interested in what they're, what they're going to pay to fill the, fill, fill the car um, and what they're going to pay to heat the house and keep the lights on. And, and, and I don't think you can ask any more of the public than that. Because their attitude is, is broadly would be the same for, for, for any other extractive industry in the UK, including, of course, coal, coal mining. Do you think they should be scared of the term then decommissioning? Say again? Do you think they should be scared of the, the, you know, the decommissioning word, as it were, that's, that we, we in the industry talk about a lot? No, I don't think they should be, should, be, should be scared. I mean, most people would be barely aware. They're aware that there's an all-sea industry out there, perhaps, and that's about the beginning and the end of it. I think 
I, you've got to go right back to the beginning of the story, and I remember as a sort of as a, in, as a teenager seeing the adverts in the Sunday Times supplement and so on and so forth. Particularly the fantastic adverts of the Brent Field. This was, you know, the, this, the, these were the days of the moonshots and so on and so forth. But that all, but Shell at that time was capitalising on, on, if you like. Um, the sort of the inner space of the, of, of, of the North Sea and the heroic engineering. Um, but, you know, every, this is an, a bread and butter, matter of fact industry in a sense. It's very important to us, to everybody in this room. But it is, at the bottom line, you know, and every, you know, it is a matter of fact industry. It's a commodity based industry. Um, decommissioning, people will say, well, what's that? But by and large, I would say, again, with the exception of this community and those who are close to it elsewhere in the UK. I think Jeremy's right, but therein lies a real challenge. We're in the process of decommissioning the Brentfield. Um, it's one of the largest decommissioning projects in any industry. Um, and it's, it's a project with a lot of firsts. It's going to have the world's largest single heavy lift. Um, you know, we, we are collaborating with NASA to survey the contents of the storage cells at the base of the concrete structures. Um, and we're looking at all different kinds of ways to accelerate the plug and abandonment of the 600 penetrations in that reservoir. Um, and it's our challenge to communicate that, you know, there's a, an, an enormous opportunity for the supply chain and for the UK industry um, to grasp decommissioning and get really good at it at the same time as building new opportunities in the west of Shetlands and elsewhere. I'd just like to pick up on so what's left in the North Sea. For this audience it's really important of course to say well you're going to have to innovate your socks off to get a lot of the stuff that's left. I'm talking about ultra high pressure high temperature targets, heavy oil which are you know viscous and difficult difficult tight gas in, in, in troublesome reservoirs um, and targets that really are difficult to see and require breakthrough imaging and, and much better technology in, in geophysics because they're hidden by salt or they're deep and, 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 um, and largely invisible. So, you know, it's the very people in this room that have the skill set and need to continue to develop the skill set to unlock that 20 billion barrels that's often referred to. All right, thank you, Glenn. Um, Trevor, the Wood Report offered a very accurate picture of the North Sea reality. In your view, what are the key points that the industry should focus on going forward on that? Well, some of them have been covered already, um, but I, I think uh, you know, it's, it's getting this balance between uh, more exploration and, and more recovery. I think that's very important, which has been said, but I think the the, the, the other piece that comes out, uh, this, you know, uh, quite aside from the technologies and the, and the different pushes on the life cycle elements that you've covered, exploration and development and, and decommissioning, is the behaviours. And uh, we covered that a little bit with collaboration, but I think the big piece is this uh, so-called tripartite three-way working, which is being encouraged between, uh, you know, the Treasury, our industry uh, and the Department of Energy and to, to try and make that a very much more constructive relationship and one that, you know, if, if it works well, uh, leads to uh, uh, a far greater recovery and far greater value back to the UK, whether it's uh, in petroleum taxes or whether it's actually in the generation of economic activity and therefore jobs and, you know, revenues a different way. And I think, you know, with the, if you take the things that you've already heard and you take the right behaviours, then there's actually a really positive story to go for. Um, but it does, it does require us, you know, there's lots of good words and there's lots of, I think there's lots of good intent, but it does require us to do something and I think quite urgently. So, you know, the talking, you know, is, can only take us so far. And, it, and, it's, and it's good that we're all, that we are all pretty aligned to that. But I think as we start to get into the actually doing it, we'll find it's, it's actually tough to, um, you know, it's tough to be uh, an infrastructure owner working with, a, you know, s smaller companies. It's, it's tough to... Uh, share data. It's it, you know it's tough to make everything kind of attractive to everybody. Um, so some of these hard conversations will have to be had. But I think if they're had in a in an environment where we're all trying to um, we're all a bit, a bit more aligned about maximising the you know what's left in the basin. And after all, I think we all benefit from this basin being very healthy in other ways as well. You know, the, there's a great training ground 
It's a great, you know, the supply chain is fantastic here. So, you know, even beyond what is primarily recovered from, you know, the North Sea, uh, the secondary benefits of actually having a base here and being, you know, ha and having a workforce here is very, is very important. So I, I think there's, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of good in it. And, you know, the other, the other aspect of it, of course, is the regulator. I don't know if that's a, you know, a second part you want to address different, separately, but uh, the, the idea of, uh, uh, of a stronger independent regulator is another big part uh, of the Wood Report and uh, something that is obviously uh, being worked on. And, and different people have different views about that. The, uh, the, there's, there is a view that um, we don't need a lot more regulation, but we actually need a lot more, perhaps, facilitation. But, you know, different views on that. I think it will be helpful. Gordon, does, do the points that Trevor just made there uh, hold the same point you see for service companies? Yeah, I think uh, I should make it clear that as far as from the Wood Review, what we take is, um, certainly from the contracting side we're fully supporting, is that it will increase activity, which is good. But we want the regulator to focus on maximising economic recovery. That's what they need to do. Laser-like, that's what they need to do. And it needs to change. It needs to do exactly what the Wood Review has said. Um, it needs a bit different mindset within government. Um, we've talked about the relationship with the Treasury, etc. Uh, but it's a chance. You, some people might call it the last roll of the dice from maximising economic recovery. You know, I, I wouldn't underestimate it. I think it's really important because this doesn't work. It's hard to imagine what else you can do in terms of structure and regulation. But the um, contracting side, service side, absolutely will play our part. Uh, the best thing for us is activity. You mentioned exactly, it's very important, um, and most companies use the United Kingdom as a centre for a lot of operations. Uh, but that, if there, is no, if there are no operations offshore Aberdeen, that will stop. That will stop. I do not see people staying here. There will be manufacturing down south, this kind of thing, but you know, global operations depend on, in my view, uh, continuing operations offshore Aberdeen. Where does Taka stand on this, Pete? Um, on, in terms of, I guess, we have to come, probably come back to the collaboration point there a little bit on the, on the Wood Report. I think the good thing it recognises is that just saying collaboration and talking about it, there needs to be something different. So the fact there is a change and, and a new regulator is to say that talking about it isn't enough. There needs to be something different. So uh, we're very positive on that and, and excited. Um, and in fact, uh, Three of us here have been working a lot on rejuvenation work around the Northern North Sea where we, we all operate. And uh, a part of what we've been focusing on is to get past um, just having the collaboration talks, but also let's actually get into some of the issues. And then that's fed off into a couple of issues in terms of um, gas supply and common facility, common infrastructure that we're working through. And that's no doubt going to be difficult and challenging but we have to make that work to take it to the next level and to maximize recovery. Um, I think to pick up on, on, on Gordon's point, um, I totally agree. We have to make sure there is an industry in the North Sea and uh, for, to have uh, the rich resources of, of people around to be able to continue to develop it. Otherwise, it will, uh, people will be pulled off to, to other areas. And that, I think, comes back to my other point on, on being competitive. And again, I think uh, when we're so challenged with actually sizable developments to be sanctioned um, and they need specific tax allowances, it kind of tells you if you roll back to the earlier part of the life cycle, you know, why are people not exploring? Why, are there, are not, why is there not exploration wells being done? Well, if a development and a discovery is struggling to be economic and get sanctioned and compete for funds internationally, it's hardly surprising that exploration is also struggling, given it's going to face technology challenges, innovation it requires, the risk you're going to take on. So there's some simple, simple things that I think we also need some, some further help from the government on. You want to add something? <laughs> well, you know, the Wood Report gets us halfway there, um, I think. The important exercise that's underway at the moment is the fiscal review by the Treasury. The tax rate's too high. In the North Sea, the tax rate's too high. Um, putting the marginal rate up to 81%, as the government did in 2011, um, 
for the PRT paying field. So they're the oldest fields and in many ways the most fragile um, was singularly unhelpful. Now they recognize that. They've tried to put in some fixes but frankly it's too complex. So when you spend more time with your tax specialist than your reservoir engineer, the chances are that it needs to be simplified, and it does. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to move on. I'd like to talk about SBE, which is obviously what we're here tonight to celebrate. Um, Glenn, I would like to put this question to you. Perhaps the oil industry worldwide, not just in the UK and Scotland here, has by far the largest number of organisations. However, SBE is the largest among all of them. Uh, how important or relevant is it for industry professionals to join such an organisation and why? Well, petroleum engineering, um, you know, is the kind of, is the core and of our business. It's where uh, so much is, is, is brought together and integrated. The geology, uh, the reservoir engineering, the production technology, um, the well engineering. So all those elements, you know, for the industry to thrive have to be very effectively integrated into, uh, into a plan. And I think this, the, the strength of the SPE is recognizing the integrative nature of success in our business. Um, and also, you know, providing enormous resources, both, you know, through the publications and the meetings um, and just the networking to help really solve the kind of tough problems we're facing. Um, there's great mentoring goes on through the SPE and it's really been an invaluable pro professional body um, underpinning the success of just about every major petroleum province in the world. Um, and it's also, I think, been an enabler to, to bring in professionals most recently from places like China, uh, from Russia. It's a truly um, international organization um, where, you know, understanding the rocks and the fluids are what we're about and set aside the politics, set aside, um, you know, where you're from and, and the color of your skin. It's about really getting under the skin of solving the tough problems that we're, uh, that we're faced with in this industry. What are your views, Jeremy, on SPE? Right, well, um, sorry folks, I'm not actually a member of the SPE. In the mid-90s, I was uh, enticed into the then Institute of Petroleum, which is now the Energy Institute. That was just happenstance, but in the job that I do, I, well, every year I have a whole host of contacts with the SP one way, shape or form. I mean, I've come November, I'll have been writing about this industry for 25 years. And if I want to break that down to some very simple, um, understandable things, then that's 12 offshore Europe's, that's 25 offshore technology conferences. And, they, and the SP is at the heart, it, it is, is at the core of events like those. So even if you're not a member of the SPE, you've, you sure as heck have come into regular contact with what the SPE is capable of, both here in Aberdeen, offshore Europe, the, re the, the bunch that come with the Monroe's Tourist Agency and the Press and Journal every year out to OTC for more than 30 odd years. That is um, very much SPE country, of course, working with, o with other groupings within the industry. Um, in, in what I do also, I have quite a lot of contact through, the, through the, the work with students and with young people and so on and so forth. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a very important body and I've encountered it basically in four corners of the world. Uh, Trevor, do you encourage employees at BP to get involved? Uh, yes, I do. And I, I'm a petroleum engineer and you know, it's, given, it's given me uh, uh, quite a lot. I mean, a, a couple of things. What, one is my first memory was when I was at Harriet Watt as a petroleum engineering student and, and we used to bus up to Aberdeen for the meetings and it, it gave me my first sort of taste of, you know, just the scale of it and, uh, you know, at the time there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of Americans, a lot of, a lot of people wandering around and, and uh, it, it, a lot of energy around the industry and that energy hasn't really dissipated, it's just changed uh, its form. And then, you know, it's also an environment where you can meet um, other people who have got your background but not necessarily uh, in your company so you know that uh, we've talked about collaboration a lot but actually one of the things that helps collaboration is knowing the people you work with and uh, you know you can meet them here and, and get to know them and you've got this common thing about 
you know, you, you're, you're attached to petroleum engineering in some way, whether it's actually your job or some, something close to it. Uh, and and it, I think it helps things as, as things develop. And the other thing it helps with is you can actually practice some leadership. You know, there are, there are plenty of subgroups uh, and, of course, the, uh, the, the, um, the boards themselves in each region where you can, uh, I guess, get a bit of experience in a fairly safe environment of leading, uh, leading groups of people that um, you don't necessarily have any positional power over and you've got to kind of try and make some things happen. I, I think it it's actually has that role as well. I think it's, a, you know, it's constant, it's uh, professional, it's respected. Uh, I think it's in, it's in one of the important associations in, in, the, in this city and, and obviously in many others. I have one question left for all of you this evening. Um, I'm going to start with you, Gordon. I apologise to you, Jeremy, because by the time we come to your, uh, your response, you'll have heard four really good answers, I'm sure, before that. <laughs> 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 but, um, start uh, yeah, Gordon, starting with you, what do you see the role of SPE Aberdeen being for the next 40 years? Um, so I think uh, key things that has to carry on are technical leadership. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, the position it has is, is second to none globally. Um, I think a couple of important things. One is the work with um, schools, young people, absolutely vital. And I think that's a great initiative that we heard about in your speech. Um, if I've already talked to Ross about that, we'll take that a bit further, I think, generally across the industry. Uh, but the other one, I think it was um, Glenn touched on it. You know, in the North Sea is going to need some smart thinking the next 40 years, and there's no one better than the guys placed here and girls to do that. Um, it's efficiency, it's come up with smart solutions, and in fact, that is what engineering is about. So I think there's no better place than this, and that's why I look forward to from the SP. Trevor. Uh, as you say, we're going we're gonna to end up agreeing <laughs> wholeheartedly. And, and Glenn, I think, started earlier with one of his comments about, uh, about you know, being innovative. Um, but I think, uh, you know, at the kind of highest level, you've got, I don't know how many um, are in the local chapter here, but it must be, it's hundreds of petroleum engineers. It may be more than a thousand. And uh, you've got, in, in those people, in, in all of you, you've got the potential for every one of you to be an ambassador for the, op the more optimistic vision of the North Sea, because as Glenn says, and of course, as, as petroleum engineers would agree with him, we are right at the center of the business. And uh, if, if you all have that vision that actually there is a lot more to be found, a lot more to be recovered, uh, and there is a lot more technology that we could either just access because it's out there and apply it, or we could invent it and then apply it. As long as, you, you know, as, long as we get after it fast enough, I think there's actually a very positive future here. Um, we're already on to you know, a good start for it, but, it, but you know, the, the more ambassadorial kind of um, envoys we can have uh, in, in our petroleum engineering community, the better. Well, yeah, we've, we've done a good job, but we've left more than half the hydrocarbons uh, in the reservoirs. So it, the hard barrels are yet to come. And, um, and you know, this is the organization that's really going to help enable getting after those hard barrels. I would hope in the next uh, 40 years there'll be a thriving onshore industry. You know, the world of energy has transformed itself. Nobody talks about peak oil anymore. Um, actually, there's no idea what the peak production could be from shale oil uh, and certainly shale gas. We're seeing huge impact of the revolution that's happened in North America around unconventionals. Um, and I have every expectation that that will be replicated in many other places. But the SPE are going to be an important organization to enable that replication to be effective. So, uh, and, and there are elements of what is going, going on right now in, in the back and in, um, in Louisiana and West Texas and, and Canada that we can and should try offshore to unlock difficult tight gas, for instance, in the Southern Gas Basin. So, you know, the ability to um, spread some of the incredible breakthroughs that have been achieved in our industry um, is going to be greatly enabled by, by the SBE. Thank you, Glenn. Pete? Um, I think that the next 40 years it really will require a whole other level of innovation. Um, I think uh, a number of folks have said, you know, once the great opportunity the SPE provides is to get out of your workplace, get
get with other colleagues uh, who've, uh, who are facing similar challenges and see how they're looking at it. Are they looking at it a little bit differently? Then throw in the mix of some slightly different disciplines, which I think is a big plus in SPE, is the breadth of discipline that's there. And often you get innovation that isn't uh, earth shattering in itself, but just makes that little difference. And then that becomes the little difference that somebody else comes along, looks at it a little bit different, and you build on. And you get these marginal gains that keep making a difference. And I think that's what's good with an organization that's been around 40 years is you can kind of look a little bit backwards to look forwards. And so if you look backwards, you'd see that a lot of what we work and what we see today, we didn't see then. And then so it just inspires more of this working environment, more for this organization to help, to help drive for the future. So it's, we're, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging point, I think, in the North Sea, but it's a really exciting pivot point that I think we do have to grasp and, and drive it forward. So. And SP has to be at the heart, I think. And last but by no means least, Jeremy. It needs to remain an inclusive organization. What do I mean by that? The SP is a lot more than simply a group of petroleum engineers. There are many other disciplines wrapped into the SP. And, uh, and uh, it is, it's very welcoming to some, 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 some quite surprising other people, if you like. And that's really, really important. I think it also needs to make sure that in spite of the huge experience in this town and the fantastic uh, alumni that it has, that it has got to stay at heart a young, sharp organization. It must, main, it must, it, 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 it must make very sure that it's uncompromising standards. For example, the, 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 the um, conference papers, the technical papers and so on and so forth that come out of, the, uh, that, that, that come out of offshore Europe, the likes of OTC, are the best that I've ever, ever experienced uh, anywhere. And those, those standards must, must, must continue. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's got a, it, it has a, a, a great future. Um, and I'd like to think that in you know, 10 or so years' time, that in the context of the UK, that it goes way beyond what's going on in the offshore industry, that it, that, that, that it actually has a significant stake in what many people hope will be a significant onshore sector, et cetera, et cetera. All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for your contributions here this evening. I hope you've all found it uh, enjoyable and, and thought-provoking also. It's time now for dinner to be served. We do hope you enjoy.